die. You're not gonna die. <laughs> You're not gonna die. <laughs> There is the final abode of the wicked. It is a lake of fire and brimstone. For the murderer facing his victims, there is a judgment. For the abortionist facing all the little babies that he's killed, there is a judgment. For the rapist that's, that's, that's molested these women, there is a judgment. To the drug dealer that's ruined the lives of countless thousands, there is a judgment. No more pleading, no more begging, no more words. Time for words are past and gone. No more opportunities, no more, no more revivals, no more preaching, no more invitations. No more, no more, no more. What preacher cannot do? Oh, what can you do? Some Christian, tell them what they can do. Somebody that's been born again today, you tell them what they can do. What must I do, the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas. What must I do, he said, to be saved. And Paul answered him and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt are numbered on this earth. One thing Satan can do to keep you occupied, to keep you preoccupied, to keep your mind constantly on trafficking, buying, selling, living, whatever else that occupies your time and your mind 24-7, he will do that. Make no mistake that he will keep your mind occupied to where you don't think about where you're going when you leave this world. Eternity is forever. You're living a temporal life. You breathe in, you breathe out. Your heart beats and the blood courses through your body. But your body will cease to live one of these days. That's something you need to come to grips with today. Some of you live in denial. You think I'm young and I'll never die. Some of you think, well, medical science will find an answer for whatever problem that I have. So you put off and put off and put off and put off the inevitable, but the inevitable will catch up with you one day. Death has much patience. Make no mistake about that. Inevitably, every one of us will go through that door of death. If the Lord Jesus Christ does not come soon, we will pass, as David said, by the way of all the earth, and your days will come to an end. This is the area that philosophy and psychology and education and so forth wants to leave alone because they don't know anything about it. They can't handle it. It goes beyond them. They have no control over it. They cannot look into eternity. This is where the Bible sets itself apart from every other book on the face of the earth because it speaks with authority clearly and distinctly about what lies beyond the door. Of death. If this were your day of death and it did come your way, and it can come a lot of different ways. You could be shot dead by a robber in a bank. You can be killed in a car wreck on your way home. An aneurysm could explode in your brain and you could bleed to death. Your heart could collapse and you could stop breathing. You could have a stroke or anything of that nature. There are a lot of things that can go wrong with the human body. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here 2,000 years ago, preached more about eternity and hell than anybody that ever walked this earth. That is undeniable. There is no way that you can read the New Testament and deny what the Lord Jesus said. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. You're a logical man or a woman. You're a thinker. You tell me how that you know there is nothing beyond the grave, since we have an abundance of overwhelming evidence that tells us that there is something beyond the grave. For in the medical science today, the ability to resuscitate, and they'll call it out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences, they abound. If you get on the internet and begin to check into medical science, you'll find out that cardiologists that spend their days dealing with people, some of them dropping dead in their very sight, are resuscitating these people. And my, do they have stories to tell. If it was only a story, you might say to yourself, well, you know, anybody can create a story. But how do you explain the fact that these people leave their bodies 
and can can explain in detail what was done to them while they were while they were supposedly clinically dead. If you died right now, you'd find yourself probably in the greatest shock that you could ever imagine. For some of you do not believe there is a hell. You've been told that when man dies, he dies like a dog, and there's nothing that lies beyond the grave. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible does not try to prove anything to you. It simply makes a statement and declares these things to be. I can look beyond the grave. If you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will lift up your eyes, falling in a pit. You will be falling headlong down, down, down into the pit of hell. It'll be the greatest shock that you ever had in your life because you do not believe that it exists. If you think that this life is all there is, you're in for a big surprise for you will come down to the end of life, some quicker than others. Some only live a few years, some many. But the point is, for it is appointed to men once to die and you will die. And my friend, that's just the beginning for the scripture says there is a second death. The second death is the death of the soul. It's the death of the identity. It's the death of the person within the person. It's the death of who you are. It takes you to a place where your identity is gone, where nobody knows who you are or cares who you are. The second death is a place of damnation. It's a place of torment. It's a place of hell. And I want to warn you right now this morning, the Word of God doesn't care, my friend, what kind of religion you have. It doesn't care about your education. It doesn't ask you how much money you've got in the bank. He's not concerned concerned about your friends. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive or clothes you wear. The word of God is clear. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's not my word. I'm simply telling you what the word says. The second death awaits those who know not the Lord Jesus Christ. But let the son of God himself with his own words tell you what lies beyond the grave. In Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 5, he says this, Luke 12 and verse number 5, no more sobering words were ever said on this earth than this. I don't know how you could warn somebody any, any greater than this. Luke chapter number 12 and verse 5, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Have you noticed the wording? That's very important. To die doesn't put you in hell. Note carefully that death and hell are separate. They're two separate things. You can't, no man has the power to put you in hell. No being has the power to put you in hell, but he does. He said, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear, that my friend fear him, that after you hath died, hath power to put you in hell. That's what the Lord Jesus just said. He said, yea, I forewarn you. Now, my friend, take that warning, would you please? Would you please hear what the Son of God has to say? If you shut your eyes in death in this world, that's one thing. But the Bible says that he has power. He has authority. He has the ability to cast you into hell fire. I don't want to go there. I want you to understand something. You hear me well. I don't want to go there. There's no mitigating circumstances, no courts of appeal, no judges, no judgment. Once you are cast into hell fire, you're in the very presence of the Almighty being judged by Him. There is no higher court. There is no appellate, for, appellate court from that place. You're there and there you'll remain. Are you sure? Are you absolutely certain? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt if your heart stops beating in the next 30 minutes and your body dies, where you are going to go? For the Bible said, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him once you're dead that hath power to cast you into hell. That's a fearful thing. That's the kind of warning that somebody ought to take. And here's how he finishes it. He said, yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now, my friend, if you have, if you have any sense at all about you to understand that you're here and you're going somewhere, you ought to take heartily in your heart that warning. He warned you. The public school system didn't warn you. The government didn't warn you. My friend, the secular society that you live in didn't warn you. They don't know 
what they're talking about. You understand? They do not know what they're talking about. But this book I have in my hand is the word of God. And he said, I warn you. Yay, he said, I warn you. Listen to the voice of the Son of God. He said, I warn you. The one that went to the cross and bore your sin in his body. The one whose back they laid open with a cat of nine tails. The one they nailed the nails in his hands and in his feet. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said, I forewarn you. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and hell. I forewarn you. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He said, I forewarn you. And the throne of God and of the Lamb become one throne. He said, I warn you, there is none greater. In Revelation 1 verse 18, he is called the Almighty. He is God Almighty manifested in flesh. There is none greater. He's God if there is God and there is no greater God than the one that said, I forewarn you. Where you going dear friend? You've had a warning. In Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11, in the latter part of humanity's existence, as it comes down to the end, as it all winds up, he says this in Revelation 20 and verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And the Bible says when this great white throne, when he sits upon the throne, and his visage is, un, is, is open, up for creation to see when they begin to look upon the face of the Almighty. They can't take it. They've got to move. They can't stand before Him. Nothing can stand before Him. He is so holy. His light is so pure. His love is so refined. He is who He is. And nothing can stand before the God that I serve except He be purged. He's got to be cleansed. He's got to be changed. He's got to be saved. He made a son of God out of him so you can stand before him one day and you can worship him and take in his glory. Boy, you talk about soaking up something. When you take in the glory of that glorious being that is from everlasting to everlasting and creation can't even stand it. Imagine what he's raised you to. So the Bible said this white throne, they marched before it. Who are you? Will you be there? Will you be at the white throne judgment? Will you be at the place, my friend, where they mock God? They make fun of him. They laugh in his face. They, my friend, do anything they please. They wallow in their iniquity. And they think that they're going to be able to live like that and just die and it's all over with. I'm sorry, you're sadly mistaken. As the bumper sticker said, you better hope there's no God because of the way you're living. My friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. You'd better hope there is no God if you're living like hell itself. But I'm going to tell you this morning, there is. There is. There is. That biology textbook that's nothing but a piece of garbage that's based upon the premise of evolution, which is nothing in the world more than a bunch of old wives' fables, cannot be proven in a laboratory, cannot be demonstrated. My friend, the theory, and that's exactly what it is, an unprovable theory that is called a theory of evolution, becomes the hallmark, the faith, the foundation of infidels and those who deny that there is a judgment hereafter. It is so much easier for them to believe in a non script thing in something that has no reality and basis and they can believe in something where there is no judgment in the future and so there's no reason in life and there's no purpose in existence other than what you make out of it and that's what they want to pump into the brains and minds of kids that go to school today but I'm going to tell you what lies beyond the grave no man can tell you what's there but God can there is a place that is so horrible that the human mind cannot conceive it. But it was not conceived by the human mind. It was originated in the word of the living God. It was made for the devil and his angels. And you will be in for a surprise. For you will lift up your eyes in hell. This preacher's trying to warn you this morning what lies beyond the grave. And it'll be a day of shock like you've never known in your life. 
It'll be hard for you to take it in. You'll probably believe that it's all a dream, that somewhere along the line that you're going to wake up and it'll all be over with. But you'll find yourself continuing to fall into hell. Deeper and deeper and deeper you'll go into the pit of the condemned. The Bible calls it the bottomless pit and into hell you'll go. It is a place of reality. You cannot deny its existence because you're there. You would want to tell folks on this earth where you are, especially those that you care for and that you love. You'd want them to understand that you're in hell, that all that they believe about hell is a lie, that their, that their liberal religion has lied to them, their preachers have lied to them, their science has lied to them, that they believed a lie all of their life because you're in hell and you want them to know about it, but you can't tell them because they have the living word of the living God and into hell you go. If the rich man could be brought up this morning and I could stand him here on this stage before you and give him five minutes to preach, you'd never heard a message in your life like you'd hear from him. He'd let you know in unknown certain terms that hell is a place of fire. Hell is a place of loneliness. Hell is a place of burning. Hell is a place of sorrow. Hell is a place of despair. Hell is a place of lostness. There is no other place on this planet like hell. Into the heart of it he falls and it begs you and, and plead with you if at all possible please accept the Lord Jesus. Please repent of your sin. Please get right with God now while you can. While the day is near. While the hour is right. While you can be saved. The rich man had begged you, plead with you. He'd do anything he could for you to keep you out of hell. In Luke chapter number 16, he said, Sin Lazarus, I've got five brethren. I don't want them to come into this place. They're going to see me here. They're going to ask me why I didn't warn them. I'm going to have to spend eternity with my five brethren in hell. He's been there 2,000 years. If he could just have one moment of peace, just a little moment of peace, just a second or two away from the flames, he'd beg for it. Oh, what he'd do. But he has none. It's night and day, 24-7. His mind must endure it. He knows, being a human being, that there's a tomorrow and another tomorrow and another tomorrow. He knows there's no end to his suffering, and that is suffering itself. Just to know that there will never be a time when hell will turn him loose. He is in a horrible place. Horror like horror has never been known. Let the horror of knowing that you're going to burn forever flood through your soul. Let the horror of know that you're in a dark pit and you'll never have relief from that that is hell enough for you and hell enough for anyone and without the Lord Jesus Christ you'll go to hell he's been fallen for 2,000 years many have been fallen for 2,000 years they've been screaming they've been begging they've been crying and my friend they can't do a thing to get out of hell what a place it is the Bible says in Luke chapter number 16 it's a place of torment and torment he is, tormented night and day, night and day, night and day, said preacher. What a horrible thought that somebody would go to hell. Was that somebody you, dear friend? Are you sitting here this morning listening to me, fully cockeyed, convinced in your mind that you're good enough never to go to hell, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can keep you out of hell. The Bible said there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I can understand why. They wail because of where they are. They gnash their teeth one against another and fire engulfs them. They breathe fire. They live in fire. Fire embraces them and they scream night and day. The sounds of hell must be horrible. Imagine all the souls are in the pit. There must be a horrible sound if you could pull back the gates of hell this morning and hear what's going on. You wouldn't want to hear it. You wouldn't want to hear that kind of crying. You wouldn't want to hear the loathsome scream that comes up out of hell. It rises way deep down inside a pit where men and women know they have no hope. In a place where the dying die and never live. A place where the second death begins to take its toll on the human soul. Dying and never completely dead. Dissolving and never completely dissolved. Hell, my friend, is what the Bible says in Luke chapter number 16. 
the rich man died and went to hell. There was a hell at the cross. There was hell in the nails and continues to fall. When hope is gone, nothing but despair floods the soul. He burns and he burns and he screams. And those about him scream. And those about him burn. I cannot imagine. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. All I can do is just try to preach to you and paint you some kind of a picture to give you an idea of what this horrible place is like. I want you to know that the fear of God is not before any man today. Men and women today live like there is no God. There is no judgment. There is no hereafter. There is no accountability. They do as they please. They murder as they please. They have sex as they please. They kill babies as they please. They live like they are themselves a law unto themselves. And the day will come when they'll find out that there is a God Almighty. Hallelujah. There is a Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the name. There is one greater than us who is the judge of us, who is the king of the universe, and his name is Jesus. If hell tried to take hold of me right now, if hell tried to grasp my soul, if hell tried to reach up and say, I'm taking you into the pit, I'd put my hand out and I'd say, no, in the name of Jesus, I've been to the cross, I've had the blood, I've been saved, I've been washed in the blood, I cannot go to hell. Hell would have to recede. It would have to say, yes, that's true. Hell would have to acknowledge the power of the Word of God. I'll lay my head on my bed at night. I can sleep in peace. For if I don't wake up in this world, I know, I know, I know, I know, I will not wake up in hell. Amen. Hell ever enlarges itself. It is never satisfied. It's like a giant squid that reaches out and pulls into its midst all it can. Its mouth is agape and open and wide it receives. All that would reject the Lord Jesus Christ are going into hell. Lost without God and without hope and falling into hell. What a sensation it must be to be falling head over heels. Down, down, down you go. And you fall headlong into hell. You scream, you beg. And my friend, it doesn't do any good because you're in hell. Hell hath enlarged itself. It's wrapped its arms around you. It's pulling you into its midst. Down you go further away from God into damnation itself. And there's nothing you can do. You are in the pit. You're in a place called hell. And your mind goes back to what you might have said on this earth at the times you've heard the gospel and been the preacher begged you to get saved and you rejected him the memory in hell must be horrible torment the thirst must be horrible it must be terrible to burn night and day 24 hours a day seven days a week and you say there is no hell to your surprise you'll find it out firsthand Hell is populated by demons. It's populated by fallen angels. It's populated by people, by the tens of thousands, yea, even millions. And you continue to fall. You won't be alone. There'll be many around you. But there's no comfort from all those about you because you're in hell. Hell is a place of torment. It's a place of sorrow. It's a place of suffering. It's the end of a Christ-rejecting life. It's waiting for every last human being on this earth if Christ has not borne them into the family of God. It's a place of horror. Abraham said, son, remember. And my friend, you will remember. You'll remember this message that you're hearing right now. You'll remember the messages that you heard in any other church, any other preacher, a faithful man of God that tried to warn you about hell. You'll never forget that message. Your memory will be as clear then as it has ever been. For it'll be the thing that haunts you throughout eternity. And that is the life that you lived on this earth. And you continue to fall. That memory will eat at your soul. It'll lead at your heart. It'll lead at your very being. It reminds you over and over and over again of the opportunities that you had to be born again. And you refused them, rejected them. You had plenty of time, you say. I'm going to live forever. I feel like I'll be here forever. And that's the average person. But you won't live forever. There is a destiny waiting every last one of us. There is a door we go through. There is a time you breathe your last. There comes a time when your heart beats its last. That is the reality 
that you've got to deal with. And when you leave this world, where, dear friend, are you going? The Lord Jesus Christ said, don't fear him that can destroy the body. He said, yea, I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him that hath power not only to destroy the body, but to cast you into hell. And that, my friend, is in the hands of the living God. The Bible said it's a terrible thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's exactly where you fall when you leave this world without the Lord. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. It is the fire of holiness that consumes in hell fire. It burns nothing to burn it up. It doesn't need anything to burn as we understand. It is that burning flame that consumes and consumes and consumes and burns and burns and burns forever. The screams that rise up from hell, the Bible said is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You think you won't, but you will. The time will come when you'll wail and weep and gnash your teeth. Don't let that happen to you. You can stop it now. You could do something about it this very moment. For the Lord Jesus Christ suffered your hell at Calvary to keep you out of air. And that that I just said to you will ring through your soul throughout eternity if you go to hell. The Bible said weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And you continue to fall deeper and deeper and deeper you go into the bottomless pit. The horrors rise up beside you. The sound and the screams and the smell and the fire all encompasses you because you're dropping down into the land to the condemned. They that enter in have no hope. There is no hope in hell. There are no children in hell. There is no peace in hell. There, my friend, is no mercy in hell. There, my friend, is no grace in hell. But hell is a place of torment and damnation. Oh, I didn't write the Bible. I didn't say a word about it. God didn't consult with me. This book was written before I was ever conceived. And hell fire was there before I ever came into this world. The Bible said hell was not made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. And you continue to fall deeper and deeper and deeper into condemnation. Condemnation is a process from the moment that you're born in this world till you take your last breath. You're going down a path. Either that path leads to Christ or that path leads to hell. And the day will come when life ends and you'll find out one way or the other where you're going. I am so thankful to God today for the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses from all sin. For I know whom I have believed. I know that I'll not go to hell. Thank God for that today. But do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? You say, I don't know what lies beyond the grave. Then you're a fool to play Russian roulette with your soul. For I guarantee you one thing, you're going to die. And what awaits you beyond the grave, friend, is horror without imagination. The Bible calls it a bottomless pit, and you continue to fall. Down you go, deeper and deeper, into the clutches of condemnation, into the clutches of despair, when your own heart and your soul one day will remember and come to the realization that you'll never have a place to go to. You'll never get out of there. You're condemned in hell, fire, and damnation forever. You're in a land of sorrow, a land of condemnation. Think about what I'm saying to you. There's a reality of where you're going when you leave this world. Either you're going to the Lord God and you're going into the land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar or you're going to hell fire you're going to the pit you're going to the land of the damned you're going where there's no hope you're going to condemnation you're going to hell and so my friend when that day comes you'll scream you'll beg there's praying in hell you better believe it there's crying in hell every imagination of a human mind all the emotions that make us what we are, rise up out of hell, but there's no one down to help, and no one there cares. No one next to you screaming, this one's screaming, you're screaming, and you're in hell. You say, preacher, why would such a thing happen to a human being? It's when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you refuse the sacrifice that was made for you, where there at Calvary, God the Lord, the Son of God, took your hell into his body on the tree, and we deny him, and we reject him 
Him every single day of our lives and by doing so write our own death warrant. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. All that God requires of you at this moment is, Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. Why wouldn't you get up out of your seat? Why wouldn't you get on your knees? Why wouldn't you cry out to him for mercy? You say, hell is a horrible torment. Yes, but the way of salvation is the free gift of God. And you can accept that or reject that. And that's the choice you make. Then the day will come when those that are in hell falling, deeper and deeper headlong into the pit will hear a voice. It'll be a voice unlike any voice they've ever heard. It'll be a voice that reaches to the lowest hell. It'll be a voice that shakes the very foundation of the pit itself. And it'll hear a voice that stops the fall. It'll hear a voice that shakes hell. It'll hear a voice that hell responds to. It hears the voice of the maker, the master, the creator, the lord of the universe. And hell itself begins to rise. Higher it comes, up to the surface. Oh, for a fleeting moment, the soul has been burning for a thousand years. May have one moment a thought of respite. Possibly I can be forgiven. Maybe God has changed his mind. Oh, maybe an opportunity. I'll repent. Oh, Jesus, I'd repent. I'll repent, Jesus. But it's too late. Hell has marched before him. And there you stand with the smoke and the torment and the condemnation all over your being. You've been a reality that you wish a thousand times you could just cease to exist. But you've got to be brought before the great white throne judgment of Almighty God. In the distance, he sees a throne. What is that, he says to himself. It's a great white throne. It's huge. The whole universe points to that throne. As a matter of fact, there is nothing but the throne. He looks above him, there's nothing. He looks beneath him, there's nothing. He looks about him, there's nothing. As he realizes for the first time in all of his existence, it's all about God and him alone. No big names here. No, I, no identities here. Nobody to brag here. It all comes down to the maker and his creation. One by one, they march before the throne. One by one, the books are opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life. And every name that is not found written in that book of life will hear a voice say to him, depart from me. You cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And at that moment, the choice is no more. No more pleading, no more begging, no more words. Time for words are past and gone. No more opportunities, no more, no more revivals, no more preaching, no more invitations. No more, no more, no more. And something takes hold of you that's more powerful than you. And as it drags you away, you hear the roar, and it's a roar unlike any you've ever heard before. You've been in the hell, you've been in the fire, you've watched the sides fly up by you, you've smelled the stench, you've tasted corruption, you've been covered with vileness, but now you're being led away to a roar, a roar like you've never known until you approach it and now you begin to understand there is something worse. There is something that hell itself is going to be cast into. There is that final judgment for the murderer facing his victims. There is a judgment for the abortionist facing all the little babies that he's killed. There is a judgment for the rapist that's, that's, that's molested these women. There is a judgment to the drug dealer that's ruined the lives of countless thousands. There is a judgment. You hear it, now you smell it, now you see it. They take hold of you and they cast you physically alive, as alive as you can be, condemned into a lake burning with fire and brimstone. That is your final abode. There you will burn forever and ever. Hell itself, as horrible as it is, is headed to the lake of fire and brimstone. That means you 
will be cast kicking and screaming and begging into the lake of fire and brimstone. And when you sink into that lake, it is your eternal abode. The Bible said, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It says that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever into the lake of fire and brimstone. And then from the minds of all that ever knew you, all that ever loved you, God will wipe your very memory from their mind. For those in heaven will not have to sorrow over you. It'll be, it'll be as though you never existed. And the Bible says the memory of the wicked shall rot and you'll be done for. I didn't give you a Hollywood script. I didn't read from somebody's romantic book. I didn't tell you about what some religion teaches. I gave you the words of the Son of God who died on a cross 2,000 years ago that you could be saved to keep you out of hell. There is the final abode of the wicked. It is a lake of fire and brimstone. Would you just hear me for a moment? Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. You don't have to go there. What preacher can I do? Oh, what can you do? Some Christian, tell them what they can do. Somebody that's been born again to do. What must I do? The Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas. What must I do, he said, to be saved? And Paul answered him and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. What would you say to someone to keep them out of hell? They came to you and said, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to hell. What would you say to them? Would you say keep the commandments, do the, live a good life, be good to people, you know, do the best you can? That's not going to keep you out of hell. How many more services are you going to sit through and harden your heart? and stubborn you and stiffen, stiffen you. If you'd come to him with an honest heart, a sincere desire to not go to the pit, he'll stop it. And he'll start whatever grace needs to be done in your heart to save your soul.